Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher, and we are at episode 82. We are also in our second year. I don't know if some of you knew that. I know some podcasts put, you know, first season, second season. I really haven't done that. We are at episode 82. But our first year was November 1st, 2017. And now we are well into May 2019. And so for those of you that are new to the podcast or you want to find some back episodes, you can go to my website at terryfletcher.net. And they're also archived on iTunes. Um, But all the different uh, topics that we've talked about, anything you can think of. Now, YouTube, we were a little late to the party there because they had some weird rules before. But we got on YouTube about December of last year, I think. So they probably have about 25 episodes or so. But you can find us anywhere. So if you have friends that don't have an iPhone, they can still find us on Google Play. Uh, also on Stitcher Radio, tune in again, my website, even Spotify carries us. They actually put us on one of their playlists not too long ago. So I thought that was kind of cool. So today our subject matter, actually today it came to me after I recently gave a training session on ENM to a client group of mine, a pretty big client group. And they, we also had a round table discussion with the coders and the internal auditors, just about ENM coding and understanding, you know, what was missed. If my groups that my clients that I have, if they don't hit an 85% threshold, then we have them do one on ones, everybody is supposed to uh, attend the general session. And I do quarterly training for a lot of my clients. And then anybody who didn't pass their ongoing auditing with uh, 85%, then they have to come to a one on one so that we can get them up to standard. But what I was finding when I was thinking about this is I was kind of driving back uh, to my office and I noticed that there were a lot of still unanswered questions out there on what is compliant and what isn't compliant under evaluation and management services and still a lot of confusion when physicians and mid-levels are seeing patients and still trying to understand the elements they need to meet the criteria. There's a lot of unanswered questions out there as well. So we want to basically tackle the topic of those questions on ENM coding you can't seem to get a straight answer on. So I'm here to give you a straight answer and I'll also have some authoritative references so that when you bring it to your practice that you can go back and also say, okay, well, this is where it is. I mean, I appreciate when people say, well, Terry told us, so we're gonna do it. And I mean, okay, we go boost there, I'm not gonna lie. But I also want you to be able to say, okay, well, this is the information we received from Terry on her CodeCast podcast, or if you're a client as well, from our Coding Corner membership. Um, But you also want to say, because this is what's being interpreted from the Medicare manual or from an authoritative source. But first, the CodeCast podcast is also brought to you by Simple Health Radio. Join Dr. Emron each week on his radio podcast to discuss current health topics, simplehealthradio.com. Also, if you get a chance to listen to Dr. Emron's podcast, you will find a few of my clinical questions to him and his podcasts are only six to 10 minutes each. And so I encourage you to find it. It's really a great uh, podcast and he's a wealth of information and I love his voice. So if you get a chance, take the time to definitely find his podcast. Okay, for our topic. So the first thing I'm going to tackle and some things that you may know. So this may just say, okay, I'm doing it right. Or I may come up with some of those questions that you can't seem to get answered. So here we go. First, I'm going to start in the chief complaint section of the history when you are documenting either in the 1995 or 1997 documentation guidelines. I swear, you guys, today I am tongue tied. I have stopped and started this podcast about 20 times in the first four minutes. So hopefully bear with me today and I'm not going to end up throwing my computer out the window. So the chief complaint is medically necessary. That's the reason for the patient to meet the physician. So the chief complaint, it's part of the history component. If there's no chief complaint, then the service may likely be a preventative and would have to be reported using a code from the preventative service categories. So what is a chief complaint? Okay, so this question comes up all the time. And to me, this is a very simplistic question. But then when you actually look at it, you're thinking, you know what, I can see how there could be some confusion here. So a chief complaint is often stated in the patient's own words. So for example, they may say I'm here because my knee hurts, or they complain of an earache. Now, occasionally documentation states the reason for the visit is follow up. 
Okay, you want to see my head spin around? That's the way to do it. Because a simple statement of follow up is not sufficient for a chief complaint. It's necessary for a provider to document the condition being followed up on. A more concise statement would be follow up for a broken ankle or possibly follow up, let's say, for hypertension, but we'll get into to chronic conditions because there's certain guidelines there you have to meet. But let's say you're dealing with the chief complaint. So a provider will ask questions to get a complete description and chronological account of the problem to be treated. Now, according to Medicare, the HPI used to have to be treated by the physician, but now in 2019, it can be documented partly by ancillary staff, as long as the physician still shows that there was somewhere that they reflected that they reviewed and they added to the HPI. So be careful using ancillary staff for everything. They were a little bit ambiguous in that ruling for 2019. But for guidelines um, under the Evaluation and Management Services, there are eight HPI components recognized. So location, the anatomical place, position, or site of the chief complaint. So back pain, sore elbow, cut on the leg. Quality, that's a problem's characteristics, such as how it looks or feels, a possible yellow discharge, radiating pain, burning or urination, something like that. Severity, a degree of measurement of how bad it is. So it's improved by unbearable pain, eight on a scale of one to 10 scale, something like that. Duration, how long has the complaint been occurring or when it first occurred? And sometimes it's something you really have to look for in the note. So since childhood, uh, first noticed it a month ago, uh, since this morning, if they're emergency visit, something like, you know, really finding how long they've had it or how long they're telling you. Timing is a measurement of when or at what frequency he or she notices a problem. So it's intermittent, it's constant, only in the evening, etc. cetera. Con- uh, in what context? What is the pa- what was the patient doing? What you know, um, environmental factors, uh, circumstances surrounding the complaint. So while standing during exercise after a fall, uh, when they wake up, something in that category. Modifying factors versus associated sign or symptoms. Okay, a little different. Anything that makes the problem better or worse. So improves with aspirin or is worse when sitting, better when lying down. That's a modifying factor. If medication is documented as the modifying factor, it should also be noted um, as the result of using this medication, it reduces the pain or it has no effect. Associated sign and symptoms, additional complaints that may be related to the chief complaint. Sometimes those get skewed and it's hard to determine what you're actually trying to say. So the number of components documented for the history and present illness will determine the HPI level. So it's either going to be one of two things. It's either going to be brief or extended. So brief is re HPI elements. Uh, For an example, patient is here for knee pain lasting two weeks. All you have there is location and duration. But extended for more HPI elements, that's going to be patient is here for intermittent, that's timing, knee, that's location, pain lasting two weeks, duration. She states it's dull, that's her quality, and pain increases when she runs, modifying factor. So right there, I had more than four. You can see also, this is going to be important uh, when you're looking at your HCCs, your hierarchy codes, reflecting on how to expand your diagnoses is really important. Now, prior to 2015, only the 1997 ENM guidelines also allowed credit in the HPI for patients who are seen for at least three chronic conditions. But that changed, and now both the 95 and 97 guidelines will allow the status of at least three chronic conditions that must be documented, but they also have to have the status. So a statement that says patient is here for follow-up on diabetes, hypertension, and hypercholesteremia, that's not going to work. So that counts as the three chronic conditions, but the status would be, for example, Patient is here for diabetes follow-up. He is a type 2 diabetic under good control and is very diligent with managing his sugars. Compared to last visit, the diabetes remains controlled by improved diet and increased exercise. Uh, Patients also seen for hypertension. Compared to last visit, the hypertension is improved and remains controlled by the patient increasing daily activity and taking ACE inhibitors. Or you could say hypercholesteremia. Uh, Patient or compared to last visit, the cholesterol is stable. Patient is maintaining goals of total cholesterol at less than 200. So those are things that you can say that would support those three chronic conditions and then the status thereof. So one thing I like to do is on occasion go back and reread some of the Medicare Learning Network, the MLN Matters articles, 
And those are some of the transmittals they put out. Also some of the Security Act section and then some of the Medicare Manual section, just to make sure I have the verbiage right when I refer to an authoritative reference. And I was going back and taking a look at both the 95 and 97 guidelines, especially since things are going to change here in about a year and a half. You have to make sure you have it down correctly now so that you can be compliant when we make changes for 2021. So here are some of the unanswered questions that I came up with. So how is medical necessity considered when scoring medical records? Remember, when you're getting audited, it's all by score sheet. So all services under Medicare must be what they call reasonable and necessary as defined under Title XVIII of the Social Security Act. And then they have Section 1862A1A. See, I don't... I know you love it when I do that. You all of you are like, okay, this is this is a little bit outside my wheelhouse, but I have to do that just so you know it's not my rule, it's where I'm finding it. But this section states, quote, no payment uh, may be made for any expenses incurred for items or services which are not reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of injury or to improve the functioning of a malformed body member. So it says therefore mal uh, medical necessity is first consideration in reviewing all services. So I know it's still a little bit gray there, but that's what they put in their uh, Social Security Act. So we have to follow that. And when we look at that, basically it means, and I'll just say in a nutshell, that if you order a test, a diagnostic, a treatment, a prescription, a surgery, anything, it has to relate back to why the patient came in for the encounter to begin with. And so it has to show that this was reasonable for why they came in to treat it to cure or relieve the effects. So this question comes up every once in a while. Can two physicians in the same group practice who see the same patient on the same date, each bill for an E&M service and receive payment? So physicians in the same group practice who are in different specialties, different taxonomy codes or different specialties as defined by CPT may bill and be paid, hopefully, uh, separately without regard to their membership in the same group. But if you're of the same group, you're in the same specialty, what Medicare says, and this is in their chapter 12, section 30.6.5 of their manual, it says they must bill and be paid as though they were a single physician. If more than one evaluation of management face-to-face -face service is provided on the same date to the same patient by the same physician or more than one physician in the same specialty of the same group, only one e &M service may be reported. So there is a separate section that says unless the evaluation and management is for an unrelated problem, but that is a rare circumstance, meaning that they're going to say, We're, we don't believe you on this one. So make sure that you know that it's the same specialty, same physician. It's one visit for that day. And then talking about the 25 modifier, believe it or not, this is in the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, still in Chapter 12. This is in Section 30.6.6. Can we append the modifier 21 to a nurse visit? So 99211. And I can't tell you how often I have a conversation with coding staff about this. And the answer is no, it is not appropriate to append the modifier 21 to the 99211. Not only CPT, but according to CMS, it is, a pro it is appropriate to append modifier 25 when the, when the modifier indicates that a separately identifiable e &M service was performed that meets a higher complexity level of care than the service represented by a level one. And so they were pretty clear about that. How about if a physician moves from one group practice to another? Can the physician bill for patients or bill their patients uh, as new patients if they go to the new practice? So remember what the rule is or the definition of a new patient. It's a patient who hasn't seen a physician of the same specialty, the same group practice within the last three years in the face-to-face. -face. So even though they're moving their practice from one group practice to another, that physician is following that uh, practice, meaning that the patients are following. So the provider would not be able to bill previously seen patients as new patients unless he met the criteria of the three-year guideline. And so be very careful on that one because that comes up a lot. But that one is Medicare Claims Processing Manual, Chapter 12, Section 30.6.7. What about if the physician states in the history section, same or unchanged from last visit? So will they receive the same credit for reviewing the last visit information? Well, this is a little bit gray, but here is what I found. And it says, only if the physician includes a documentation from the previous visit 
Otherwise, the reviewer would not know what the same or unchanged from the previous visit was. And that was from the FAQs um, that Medicare put on their website. For a review of systems, can the, the physician reference a sheet that they have in the patient's chart where the patient checked off items? Yes, you can. However, the physician must include the sheet with all documentation for that date of service. If they get a request for medical records, they will not get credit for the information of the checkoff sheet unless that is included as part of the medical record. Now, on the review of systems and HPI, this one comes up all the time, and I'm sure you've had this question. So can the patient's past medical history be used in scoring the review systems and HPI elements? So no, the review systems and HPI elements pertain to the chief complaint and the reason for the patient's visit that day, not past medical history. But what about when you're scoring review of systems? Can the systems addressed in the HPI be used or is that double dipping? So because the review system inquiries are questions concerning the systems directly related to the problem identified in the HPI, it's not considered double dipping if you use what's left. So try to meet your extended in the HPI and then anything left over, feel free to use that as part of your review of systems if you don't have that formal sheet that the patient filled out. Now, if the doctor just says under review of systems, CHPI, we don't give them credit. So that could downcode your your um, new patient visits to an established visit if the doctor puts that in there. So I might have addressed this one when I was talking about history of present illness, but this comes up. How can we determine the difference between modifying factors and associated sign and symptoms? So modifying factor is something done to help relieve the pain or the problem. So it took two nitroglycerin tablets with no relief, but associated sign and symptoms are sign and symptoms that are associated or related to the presenting problem. So shortness of breath or nausea or radicular pain down the leg. When a physician performs an ENM service and the patient is not able to provide a history, if the physician documents patient in a coma or patient unable to respond or patient unresponsive, can they count that as a comprehensive history? So when a physician performs an ENM service and is unable to obtain parts of the history components for that encounter, just make sure they document clearly what they were not able to obtain and why. But also the Medicare manual says you also have to show attempts to obtain information from other sources, such as a family member, a spouse, a nurse, or somebody else. So when the clinical reviewers are reviewing the documentation in its entirety, and if the documentation clearly supports that the patient is unable to provide the information necessary, history components, and attempts were made to obtain the history from other sources, then a comprehensive history can be credited. So these next two, I think I get more than anything else. It says under the examination section of the 95 guidelines, can we combine both the body areas and the organ systems? Okay, so the answer is no. The examination section of the 1995 score sheet is divided into body areas and organ systems. So the CPT manual recognizes seven body areas and 12 systems. Depending on the documentation in the medical record, you can use either or. There's actually a dotted line between the body areas and the organ systems indicating that you must choose one or the other. If you combine them, you'd be giving credit twice, which would be incorrect when determining the final score for that examination. So for an example, uh, in the documentation, the medical record could say uh, abdomen soft, credit can only be given in the body areas under abdomen or in the organ systems under GI. So whichever benefited the physician most is what I would give. Now I get a lot of neck supple. I don't get thyroid megula, so I can't, you know, look at endocrine. I can only look at body area of neck. So try to get your doctors to just expand that just a little more, because if you're dealing with systems versus body areas, you're probably going to be low a system based on the fact that you're looking at a musculoskeletal body area. And this last one is where CPT sometimes disagrees with Medicare, or I should say isn't consistent. For example, March 13th or March 2013, CPT assistant, a professional edition, page eight, stated that providers may bill an outpatient or office visit 99211 to 99215 for meeting with a patient's family to discuss the patient's care without the patient present. Is this appropriate under Medicare? Absolutely not. Medicare says right in their benefit policy manual, chapter 15, section 30A and chapter 12, section 30.6.1, that in the absence of the patient, it is not billable under the Medicare program. So you have to know that 
you may have a commercial plan that will allow it, but be careful by extending that to Medicare. Also be careful about getting sucked into some of the patient's family drama. Uh, recently, when I was mentioning I was doing some training, a conversation was had where there are some family members that are saying, you know, I really want to talk to you about, you know, my mother, she's nuts, and she needs, you know, this and that she needs to go into hospice and on and on, because she's now, you know, deteriorating in health. Well, I feel for the family, but the patient was not giving authorization or consent to speak to the physician. And so what one thing the family member said to the healthcare professional basically said, um, oh, well, let's not have any kind of, you know, trace of this. I don't want to have this discussion. I don't want to have, uh, or I don't want to have this discussion documented. And uh, the physician said, well, I, I really can't talk to you. And the whole reason this came up is that they charge for these services, which they should, and then the patient's uh, family member, the daughter was just like, well, then let's not even create a chart or anything. I just want to talk to you quick. And that you just don't understand. You can't do that nowadays. The patient is protected. So I also have some questions under medical decision making and time, but I'm actually going to save that for my June 4th episode because that one's a little more lengthy. So I just wanted to give you some of the questions you never get answered for, you know, history and exam. But I want to talk about our coding question today and actually comes from Samantha, a certified coder out of Jacksonville, North Carolina. And Samantha and her fellow coders are debating the new patient over consultation codes. Now we know that consult codes are no longer payable or recognized by Medicare, but that doesn't mean that some of the commercial and private payers still are paying for them. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're still clear when documenting. So what is a consult? Well, a consult is a referral from another physician or physician to physician or physician to mid-level on a problem that the patient is complaining of, it's usually a complaint, that a different physician needs to take a look at and make their opinion known on what is the next step for the patient. And they need to get authorization or at least report back to the referring source before they can bill it as a consult code. That's one of the reasons why Medicare took consults away from us. They basically said, wait a minute, you're billing these all as consults because it was a higher RVU, but you're keeping the patient. So you still have to basically say, okay, this doctor asked me to see this patient in consultation. This is the reason what they're presenting for. And this is what I recommend. So referral review recommend. And then that goes back to that referring source. And at that point, now they can direct care. Remember, if they're sending the patient over to treat, so for an example, let's say a cardiologist needed a patient to see um, a cardiac surgeon. They felt that they have triple vessel disease and they need a bypass surgery. So they send them over to the surgeon um, before bypass surgery and they set it right in there. That's what they need. Well, the, at that point, that's sending them over for an actual procedure where there's no question and there's no need for the consultation. So that doctor, the surgeon, would bill a new patient visit and then schedule them for surgery. But let's say that they found the patient had triple vessel disease and they really at that point weren't comfortable with just taking them in for a therapeutic stent or angioplasty and wanted that doctor's opinion first. So said, we're going to have you consult with a, with one of our uh, colleagues who happens to be a cardiac surgeon, and they're going to let you know what they recommend. So then the patient goes to that cardiac surgeon and they determine, you know what, this patient actually 85 years old at this point, we feel they could benefit from an angioplasty and they send them back to you for you then to continue with the care. That's a consult. So when you, tra when you transfer a patient, let's say you're the referring source to another physician for care, for treatment, for fracture care, for to have a, a mole removed or, you know, a lesion removed or anything like that, because you've already identified the problem and what treatment is necessary, then that is no longer a consult. And same from the reciprocal effort. If somebody sends a patient to you for treatment, for care, where they made the medical decision, then it's no longer a consult. So a consult means somebody's asking your opinion because they don't know exactly what should happen with this patient, or they're not comfortable making that decision at this time until they get another opinion or a consultative advice. So hopefully that answered the question and we appreciate that. Um, Samantha, thank you very much. Today's coding question was brought to you by Better Living since 2002, the digital lifestyle brand dedicated to travel, food, health, and home on betterliving.com. 
So I wanted to shout out and say hi to a couple of listeners this week that caught me on social media, specifically LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. So Claire from Down Under, yes, Claire is listening to our podcast from Melbourne, Australia. Hi, Claire. She's a qualified coder and a CDI auditor and told me she loves listening to the CodeCast while she goes for a walk or is driving. So we appreciate you. Hi again to Tony, who's a certified coder times three and is also uh, excited about my upcoming Business Collective podcast launch. So we are really shooting for June 1st. That's going to be how to go from employee to uh, entrepreneur. So into independent consultant, if you will, um, in the healthcare field. So hopefully you'll listen into that and I'll let you know how to access it when it's up and running. And then Vicki, Caroline, Kat, Janet, Bianca, Jody, Ian, Jan, Marilyn, Bethany, all of you, thank you for the great support and the rest of our now 54,000 listeners. We appreciate you more than you know. It is just so great to keep growing and getting the positive feedback that we have every week. Don't forget to review us and give us a rating on any platform that you listen to. We really appreciate that. So my personal tidbit this week, I am in full organization mode. I think because it's been so cold over the last few months, I haven't really felt like it's been spring. But what I did is I actually, well, there's a magazine I love and it's called Magnolia Magazine. And it's from Joanna Gaines from the Fixer Upper show on HGTV that they used to have for five years. But she had two pages dedicated to organization in her quarterly magazine. um, And I just loved it. And so what I did is I actually took the time to go to the dollar store. And if you know my days, that never happens. And got these trays for kitchen drawers to organize all the random things everywhere. I know everybody has a catch-all or drunk drawer. And so for $5 or for five uh, of these organizers for a dollar. Also, they had these small plastic jars with lids. They kind of look like little mason jars, like four inches tall, but they're plastic. And everything from tax, paper clips, safety pins, rubber bands, keys, band-aids, bag ties. They had chip clips. They had 10 for a dollar, um, you know, Q-tips, earring backs, you name it. And things you can find, but you need so often. Also, salt and pepper and sugar packets that you need to take to work. I'm a huge hard boiled egg fan. I, there isn't an egg I don't like, but without salt and it's the only thing I salt, it's not quite as good. So it's not, it was great to just find all this stuff there. I spent $20. That's all I spent. And I organized my kitchen, my bathroom, my desk drawers at my office. Now I know where my highlighters are. Um, and they're where they're supposed to be pens, pencils, and then good pens. Those are the ones I hide from my daughter, uh, paper clips, my scissors that my daughter can't uh, lose post-its, erasers, uh, lip balm, gum, Sharpies, nail files. It just makes me so happy to open my drawer and it's so organized. So trust me, the first time I've been in a dollar store in five years. I'm an Amazon person, as I've mentioned before, but it was just so nice just to take my 20 minutes where I usually go and Starbucks and get my tea. But I just thought, you know what? It's right by my house. Let me do it. Let me go in there. And oh my gosh, it was really cool. They had so many things in there. And for you people out there that run into this, how many times do you need a baby gift or a quick birthday gift? And you only have leftover Christmas wrapping paper. They had the best $1 three pack of wrapping paper. It had a birthday paper in it, a baby paper in it, and then a generic paper in it. So best 20 bucks and 20 minutes I've ever spent all week. So hopefully you find that helpful. Get out there and organize. Be ready for summer. Hopefully it's coming soon. And until next time, everybody make it a great day and a great next week. And thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma, music producer Assassin Music. <laughs>